What are your thoughts on fasting? And do you think it actually is worth the hype? Listen, I am so glad that you asked me about that because my new book is titled Eat to Beat Your Diet. And it's not a diet book. In fact, it's kind of an anti-diet book because it actually shows you, it's a little bit of a kind of a trick title. It actually shows you how you can be healthy without having to jump onto a ship of an extreme point of view or an extreme practice. And let's talk about fasting for a second. You know, here's the reality. I'm a pretty reasonable person, but I'm uncompromising when it comes to science. Here's the fact. We actually all fast anyway. Fasting is what happens when we're sleeping and we're not eating. That's the definition of fasting. So whether you're sleeping for five hours a day, six hours a day, hopefully seven or eight hours a day, which is healthy sleep, during that period of time, all right, we're not eating. And that's called fasting. And when we get up, take a shower, get dressed, go down to the kitchen and, you know, pour ourselves something, we are breaking our fast, which is why it's called breakfast. All right. And so there's really no religion or crazy breakthrough idea about fasting. It's how the body's wired. When we're sleeping, we're not eating or fasting. And when we eat, we're actually breaking our fast. Now, what is new and what does actually help argue for increasing the period that we're not eating, meaning increasing our lengthening our fasting time, is that when we're fasting, we are allowing our metabolism, the way that our body's hardwired, okay, our operating system, to be able to actually burn down extra fuel. Let me explain this to you. So when we eat food, okay, when we're breaking our fast, okay, which is breakfast, lunch, dinner, maybe some snacks, all right, what we're doing, and this is what metabolism is all about, it's all about fuel. Just like when you're driving a car, you got to load fuel into your car at the filling station. When it's loaded up, you can actually get in your car and drive away, and the engine uses that fuel to keep you powered. That's what we do when we're eating. We're eat, putting fuel into our body, and then we're actually going about our day. We're actually burning our gas, our fuel. Now, what happens is that our body's hardwired so that when we are eating, we can't burn that fuel, okay? Like our body is in completely in storage mode. It's only when we're not eating, okay, that we're actually able to burn that fuel down. So think about this. The longer we're not eating, let's say sleeping late, okay, or just not eating before you go to sleep, no midnight snack, and maybe having a late breakfast or maybe even skipping breakfast, you're extending the period of time where your body is able to burn down fuel. Well, what happens? You're actually cleaning your pipes. You're burning that extra fuel that you might have accumulated from the day before, the day before that, and your metabolism is actually just burning down that fuel because you're working on that hardwired system, that operating system where when you're not eating, you're able to burn down fuel. So you want to stay trim and lean. You want to lose harmful extra body fat, lower inflammation. Fasting actually does that for you. And by the way, other systems also respond well to that energy burning, fuel burning stage. Your circulation improves. Your stem cells improve. Your gut microbiome use that as a period to reboot itself. Your DNA is able to stand back from all the stuff you might pour into the body. And your immune system also improves as well. Reboot. So fasting is actually normal and kind of good for you. This idea. So I'm trying to tell you, we already intermittently fast just by going to bed. All right. And we can tweak it now because we're beginning to understand if you fast a little bit longer, it's better for you. But this idea that you have to fast until you go into ketosis and then you, you know, if you fast for days on end, you know, these kind of extreme ideas. Okay. They might be okay for the short term. Your body's not going to like it for the long term, I guarantee you. And it's going to wear down your health eventually. And so it's just like you want to fuel your car on a regular basis and you never want to overfill it. So that's another kind of caveat to this whole thing. But you want to run things normally. And for people that want to live long and prosper, you know, that old Star Trek Spock kind of thing, you want to be reasonable. And you want to enjoy your life and you want to do things that are not too unreasonable. And that's why these extreme patterns are really unsustainable and don't give you pleasure as well. So I'm all about sustainability, pleasure and biology all at the same time. Absolutely. And I think fasting can be a great tool too to keep your calories in check if your goal is weight loss and trying to lose weight because it reduces your, your eating window 
I know that weight loss is a theme of your new book as well. And you talk about some new things as it relates to that. I know typically when people think of weight loss, they say that, you know, you, it revolves around like energy expenditure and calories in, calories out that you're like, what you're consuming versus what you're like, how much you're moving and stuff like that. I'm like, what are your thoughts on weight loss? And like, what other insights do you have to share on that? That's featured in your new book? Yeah, well, so my book does talk a lot about weight loss and foods that have been shown in human research that allow you to lose weight. Now, this is not the quick fix, lose 20 pounds in two weeks kind of thing. I mean, there are things that you can do to aim for that, but it's not healthy for you. It's not sustainable. But what I really talk about is how I kind of uncloak how human metabolism works. So how many of us have heard this idea that, well, you're born with either a fast metabolism genetically or a slow metabolism. And people will point out, look at my sister. She was so lucky. She was born with a fast metabolism. That's why she's skinny as a stick and eat anything. And that's has a problem. And then they always point me on the other hand, I was born with a slow metabolism. My genetics aren't really good. And so I've been struggling with my weight the whole time. And that's a very common kind of, it's a common idea that's out there, but it's an urban legend. And I'll tell you when this urban legend was overturned just about a year ago, there was a landmark study that changed everything we know about human metabolism. And this was done by a study by a researcher named Herman Ponzo out of Duke University. And he studied 6,000 people involving 19 countries. Okay. And he studied metabolism in people across the human lifespan from two days old to 95 years old, the entire human lifespan, and study 6,000 people in exactly the same way. By the way, these people were male and female, men and women, girls and boys. They were um, young and old. They were healthy and sick. Some of them had diabetes. Some of them had big body frames. Some of them were skinny. And when they studied the metabolism in exactly the same way, here's what they did. They gave everybody a drink of water, H2O is what we call water, in which the H of hydrogen and O of water oxygen had a special atomic signature, not radioactive, but everybody drank the same. Now you can measure in the lab the hydrogen and oxygen and therefore your metabolism in your breath, in your urine, in your blood. And so imagine this, 6,000 people across the human lifespan from days old to 90 years old in exactly the same way. And they looked at the metabolism. What do they find? All over the map, scattergram. Everything is completely confusing. And so they said, oh, well, you know, isn't this what we just expect is that everyone's got a different metabolism? Well, that's not where the breakthrough came. The breakthrough came, they developed an algorithm, right, in which they could actually subtract out from the results of the study, the contribution of excess body fat, okay? We call fat adipose tissue. When you actually employed this algorithm to remove from the scatter of data, remove the effects of excess body fat, it was like bada bing, human metabolism emerged only four phases of metabolism across humans over the course of life. Everyone followed the same exact same pattern. So the inner workings of our metabolism are exactly the same. This idea that you were born with fast or slow, completely wrong. And the four phases are absolutely fascinating. Zero to one, your metabolism skyrockets when you're a baby to one years old. At one year old, your metabolism, baby's metabolism is faster, 50% faster than their, their metabolism as an adult, okay? Which is surprising. From one year old to 20 years old, all the way through puberty, when you see kids sprouting up, when they're super active, when they're eating two dinners, teenagers, okay? Metabolism is going down, 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 okay? To, so completely different than what we thought. From age 20 to age 60, Metabolism is completely rock stable is how we are hardwired. This is through your first job. This is through your pregnancy. This is through your menopause. All right. It's exactly the same. And then from age 60 to 90, it does decline a little bit, only about 17%. By the time you're 90 compared to when you were 60, which is the same as compared to your 20. So when you're 90 years old, our hardwired metabolism is only 17% lower than when you were 20. Now, here's what happens. So that's the pattern of human metabolism. Like it's a bombshell that this is how we're actually wired. Now, what happens is that when you start adding back the effects of body fat into that equation, what do you think happens? You take this beautiful four-stage pattern and you start to suppress it, okay? So you squash the metabolism. So it's not that slow metabolism causes you to gain body fat and gain weight. It's that extra body fat and weight 
squashes your metabolism. It's completely the other way around. And the reason that that's why that's important, and back to your question about, so what do I think about weight loss? I think that not everyone needs to lose weight, but everyone needs to understand that excess body fat, including skinny people that might not be able to see their body fat. It could be packed like peanuts inside a thin frame. Like, okay, you go to FedEx, you're going to ship, you know, some long fluorescent lights. You're going to put the lights in the box. You're going to add peanuts in it. You can overpack peanuts, tape it up, still a skinny box, but it's way overstuffed. And in our skinny bodies, in a skinny body, you can have that, those extra peanuts, that harmful fat choking your organs and releasing really harmful inflammatory substances. So here's what I think. I think we should all try to aim at getting back to our baseline metabolism so we can be who our body wants us to be from a metabolic perspective. And part of that is by fighting extra body fat. We can do this with exercise and we need to stay active, but we can also do that with by eating food. And so this is the kind of the irony of what I write about. You can eat to beat your fat. And there's even more surprises because you can actually harness and leverage good fat to burn down bad fat. And so this is there's all these series, really surprises that turn the equation around. Don't fear your food. Use your food. Don't fear your fat because we need some fat to, to live. You need to tame your fat and so on and so forth as it relates to weight loss. That's such interesting stuff because I was always one of those kids too who was like, man, that person's just lucky they have a fast metabolism or she's just lucky she has a fast metabolism. And you're right. We hear this all the time. So let's just say we have that person that might be reading your book. They're listening to this podcast and they're like, wow, I do have a bunch of extra body fat to lose. I want to be able to, in a way, jumpstart my metabolism and do what I can to control my metabolism so that I can get rid of this stuff as fast and a healthy way as possible. Like, what are a few things that you think are shown by science or that you could recommend to help them do that? Yeah, I'll give you a couple of examples. So first of all, in my book, I read about 150 foods. I think this is the first book that I ever did is 150 foods that have been shown by human clinical research that they can actually improve your metabolism, decrease amount of body fat, reduce your waistline, and improve things like your blood sugars and your insulin sensitivity and the healthy hormones that relate to your metabolism, okay? And so I think this is the first book ever to put together this compendium of all these foods. So let's pick a few out, okay? Because we don't have time to go through all of them, but I'll pick a few standouts, all right? Turns out tomatoes have a lot of good things about them. They're a great source of vitamin C. They're, they do have some dietary fiber, but they also have these bioactives, natural chemicals called carotenoids. One of them called lycopene. Lycopene, many people might have heard about, but lycopene is a fat fighting bioactive. Here's what it does. It actually takes our harmful fat and helps to burn it down by activating a special kind of fat we have in our body called brown fat. So brown fat can Good fat can burn down white fat, which is harmful fat, dangerous fat, and eating tomatoes will light that up. It kind of lights up the space heater and uses fuel so you can improve your metabolism, improves your metabolic profile overall, lowers bad cholesterol. This is all with tomatoes and actually shrinks your waistline as well. One study that was done actually took normal, healthy young women who were not overweight or obese Okay, because many researchers, many much a lot of research is done with people who are already overweight. But this is actually taking young, healthy female grad students who don't have extra weight. They're considered normal body size, whatever that means. Okay, that, that, that can be debated. But the bottom line is that they had just one tomato to eat before lunch every day, and they were able to lose weight and improve their metabolism. Very achievable dosing. So tomato can actually do it. Here's another one. Strawberries have also been shown to actually improve your metabolism. And what's really interesting by eating strawberries is that although strawberries can be sweet, when they measured blood sugar, eating strawberries in a way to improve your metabolism, not only decreased weight and uh, waist size and lowered weight and decreased body fat, it also didn't raise blood sugar. So this whole idea, another kind of like common idea that's kind of a uh, kind of like a paintbrush idea. Hey, I don't eat fruit. It's got too much sugar in it. It's got too much fructose. It might kind of sound like it makes sense, 
on a casual level, but the science actually doesn't show that. And the reason is that the bioactives in the strawberry activate your body so it starts to burn down the bad fat. Okay, so you can actually metabolize even faster. This is, by the way, not about trying to become a supermodel. This is about optimizing your engine of your body. And I think that's something that we really want to be able to emphasize. Look, people that want to actually look like you know, a supermodel, they want to fit into a bikini body back. They need to get into a wedding dress. They need to actually get you go for a, a bodybuilding competition. Those are short term things that people do extreme things for. Okay. I'm not categorically against that. I'm just saying that. And what I write about in my book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, is we should all be trying to do things that are good for our health over the course of our lifetime if we want to live long and prosper. You know, and thrive. This is what longevity is all about. So another food that can actually actually have incredible benefits is actually tea. Just sipping green tea actually has been shown to decrease excess body fat as well. So remember I told you this experiment where, you know, you when you remove the effects of body fat, your real metabolism starts to shine. And when you add unhealthy foods and you add extra fat back, you'll start to suppress your metabolism. So this is really the concept. We have a hardwired program inside us that goes through four phases of metabolism. If you want to be all you can be, work on some of the body fat, work on the metabolisms. You can eat foods like tomatoes and strawberries and green tea, and there's 150 other foods, including seafoods that I have in there, that can all work in harmony to help you get there. And so this isn't about a fad diet. This is really about a lifestyle and trying to embrace and enjoy your life as well. Yeah. And I think from what I also understand is a lot of this comes back to satiety as well. I mean, that's why, you know, people who eat a decent amount of protein, it can be good for your metabolism and weight loss because it keeps you fuller longer. And it seems like that's the same with what you're saying, especially with some of these foods that contain a decent amount of fiber, because one of the other benefits of fiber is it keeps you fuller longer, right? That's right. That's right. So when you eat, like if you ate a bean burrito, okay, provided it doesn't have a ton of unhealthy things in it, you're going to be feel full longer. It's not because the beans are heavy. It's because there's a lot of fiber in the beans and the fiber feature gut microbiome. And that actually sets into motion this series of signals in your brain that may just make you less hungry. Now there's a hormone actually that does this. It's made by body fat called leptin. Some people may have heard of leptin, but we all, you know, it's all part of this. Remember I told you like intermittent fasting is natural. Leptin is nat- natural. So we have a little bit of fat in our body, which we need. And when we eat and our stomach gets full, one of the things that happens is that the full stomach sends a signal, text messages our body fat, and our body fat releases some leptin. The leptin, okay, travels in our bloodstream to our brain and and our brain receives the leptin signal, the text messages, and that leptin says, hey, you know what? Slow down, man, like you're full. Just slow down and stop. All right. And that's basically what, when we feel full in front of a dinner plate, like, it's because our fat is signaling our brain saying, all right, you know, chill out, man. Like, stop, slow down and stop. All right, now here's what happens. When you've got too much body fat, lots of leptin gets produced. And the funny thing that we don't totally understand is your brain stops reading the leptin. It doesn't read the signal anymore. And so even though you make more leptin, you're always hungry and you don't, never stop eating. And so basically what you want to do is to tame that fat so your brain becomes more sensitive to leptin and leptin will tell you chill out. And by the way, when you eat, if you eat too quickly, you'll outstrip the speed of your signal that your stomach is full and your fat will make the leptin. So you can chuck a ton of food into your gut and you can overeat really easily if you eat super fast. And so this is another kind of like trick to actually optimize your metabolism is Eat the healthy, eat the right stuff, but eat more slowly. Don't wolf your food down because you'll beat your body's ability to signal, to turn on the off switch and then you'll overload. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got to eat slowly. I've also heard like eat till you're about like 80% full or something like that. And I think these are, can be some great tools that you can do as you're eating to not eat as much. And if your goal is to lose weight, this will likely help you to do that as well. I want to shift gears just a little bit. You talked about how somebody can be lean, but quote unquote, also obese. In your research, even in your practice, like, do you believe that people who are obese can still be metabolically healthy? Okay. So here's a way that I want people to think about the idea of body size, right? And I want you to think about 
healthy people, super healthy people. They can have different body sizes. And how do we know this? Look at Olympic athletes. You got your tiny little gymnasts. You've got your shot putters. You've got your lean track stars. You've got your svelte ice figure skaters. There's a champion, there's an Olympian in every body size category. And then if you want to take a look at another sport like boxing, you've got 14 weight categories, you've got featherweight to heavyweight, and there's a champion, there's a world champion in every there. And then if you want to really look at an extreme, look at sumo. These are behemoths, three to 400 pounders, right? People would call them obese. And yet, actually, they don't suffer from the diseases that you would normally think about, heart disease and diabetes and cancer. They don't actually get them, and, and yet, and they're in super fit shape, all right? And so the first thing that I think is really important is to, for us to kind of rethink this idea that large body size is equated to poor health. Size matters, but it's not the only thing that matters. What's actually happening inside matters a lot more. So back to your question. If somebody has got a large body size, can they ever be healthy or are they stuck being unhealthy? And what I would say is that the science tells us you can unleash your inner metabolism by focusing on ways that allow you to burn down harmful body fat, including the stuff you can't see, which is packed inside your body, whether you're thin or big, and you'll actually start to improve your health overall. So I think that there's a different measure, like true health isn't visible in the mirror. That's the key thing. And you can't measure it automatically on a scale. And yet that's what we have come to think is that when you step out of the shower in the morning, out of the corner of your eye, you look in the mirror and you see some lumps and bumps, you know, like, oh man, that really stinks. I must not be as healthy as I can be. I got to go to the gym where you step on the scale, the number that comes up isn't the one that you want to see. And you kind of like, you know, you have some self-loathing about that. It's a wrong way to think about it. The fact of the matter is that we are all hardwired to be healthy. We've got health defenses. Our metabolism is there. And so what we want to do, if people haven't thought about this before, it's never too late to take advantage of the new science that says we can make these little moves, little adjustments, and eat delicious food at the same time to help us kind of maneuver our way towards better health, regardless of your body size. I think a lot of people now, based on stress, based on their lives and just, you know, maybe what's going on over the last few years where people are just kind of at this low level stress, their energy is depleted just naturally. And maybe they're aware of it, maybe they're unaware of it. In your research, in your experience, what role does food play in this? Like, do you think that, you know, if you eat processed food all day, it can have an impact on your mood or do you think that's false? No, no, it's, it's absolutely true. The science shows that to be true for sure. Our diet affects our gut microbiome, the healthy bacteria in our gut. And a lot of people may not realize this, but the research is really, really making it clear. The healthy gut bacteria that we have in the lower part of our gut is in our colon, a part of the colon called the cecum. It's a little bag near the end of our gut. It's filled with something on the order of 39 trillion bacteria. It's called our gut microbiome. And when you talk about gut health, largely it's, it's referring to actually that bacteria being very happy. It's an ecosystem. Think about that bacteria ecosystem like the Great Barrier Reef, all right? It's an enormous collection of life, bacteria being life. And in the Great Barrier Reef, you've got this myriad, you've got different corals, you've got turtles, you've got big fish, you've got sharks, you've got all kinds of different colorful things, living organisms living together, and it makes the sea around it healthy. And our gut bacteria makes our bodies healthy. They help us heal, they help our immune system, but very importantly, back to the mood and the sleep part, it turns out we now know our gut bacteria sends text messages to our brain. And among the things that our gut bacteria helps our brain release, our social hormones and hormones that control our mood and lower our anxiety. Hormones like serotonin, like dopamine, like oxytocin. These are the hormones that make us depressed, happy, sad, anxious, moody, cloudy. And also the good news is that when your gut bacteria is happy, it makes our brain release happy hormones. One of them is called oxytocin, as I mentioned. Oxytocin, there's a one bacteria, by the way, called lactobacillus ruteri. And this is just how one area of research, and I want to cite for your for people listening to this, lactobacillus ruteri, which is a natural gut bacteria, text messages to our brain, it causes our brain to release oxytocin. 
Oxytocin is a mood hormone. It's a brain hormone that makes us feel good. It's the same hormone that you get when you are picking up a good friend at the airport and you see them coming out of the, you know, to the baggage claim and you give them a big hug. All right. You feel good, right? That's oxytocin. Your brain is flooding out. When you have a kiss, a French kiss, your brain is pouring out oxytocin. It makes you feel good. When you have an orgasm, for a few microseconds, your brain is pumping out as much oxytocin as it can. When you disturb your gut microbiome by eating foods that destroy our gut health, you actually interfere. You snip the wire. You prevent that text message from coming through. You know, it's, it's kind of like putting your your mood, your connection, but to your gut brain connection on airplane mode. It can't signal. And so therefore, you don't feel as good. Now, what are some of the foods that can actually actively destroy our gut brain connection? Unfortunately, it's the food that we tend to consume the most, ultra-processed foods, the stuff in a box, in a bag, in a can, in a tin, and the things that have you know 20 or so ingredients that you can't pronounce, except that what you know is that they're artificial preservatives, artificial coloring, artificial flavoring, you know, additives that actually make it last longer on the shelf. All those things that kind of had made our modern mass food industry, the Goliath that actually is, we're beginning now to do the research to realize, you know what? I'm glad that, you know, we're able to address the hunger needs of more people, but the quality of the food, remember the quality of the fuel in your tank, that's low quality fuel. And when you actually put all those chemicals in your tank, you're poisoning your gut bacteria. When your gut bacteria are poisoned, they're not able to, you put them on, you put them on airplane mode. They're not able to signal to your brain. In fact, sometimes they send inflammatory signals, which actually darken your mood to begin with. That's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, and I love the way you kind of describe that because like I have heard that like the neurotransmitters like, you know, dopamine and serotonin, they are, a lot of them are made in our gut and they, like you're right, they impact so much of our mood. And I think what I'm also hearing you say is if somebody's looking to improve their mood and reduce their stress and improve their outlook on life, they should obviously deal with the uh, underlying trauma, whether that's through therapy, or whatever, you know, method of healing that they um, resonate with the most and focusing on sleeping more than focusing on improving their diet quality and moving their body more. I think all of that obviously will help people reduce stress and improve their overall quality of life. So many people, when they start a journey on health and fitness, they have this all or nothing approach. Like I am going to be all in or I'm all out. And the moment I slip up, you know, I'm done because that means I'm a failure. That means I suck. That means I'm not made for this. I've been there. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people that are listening to this, I'm sure they've maybe experienced this to some degree or they know somebody who has. What's your take on that? Like, how can somebody, you know, get back on the path, the healthy path, if you will, after maybe they didn't have a good night's sleep and maybe they overate the one day or maybe they had enjoyed themselves at a party to, like more than they wanted to? Like, what's your advice for people to keep moving forward? Yeah, listen, I mean, what you just described is so common and, and it's happened to me many times over the course of my life. I'm a medical doctor. I trained to be a medical doctor. There's no lifestyle less healthy than going to medical school and training to be a doctor. You don't get enough sleep. You don't eat quality food. You're stressed out all the time for a long period of time, like years. And you're confronted with, you know, things that are overwhelming, scary, depressing. I mean, you know, like it's a, it's a very difficult part of the journey. And so I, you know, I've walked that walk, I can tell you. So one of the things that I, I sort of want to communicate to anybody listening is that the first thing you need to know, no matter where you are in this journey and how you're feeling, know that your body, your systems, your metabolism, your health defenses are like a gyroscope. Your body's like a gyroscope. And for those of you who don't know what a gyroscope is, it's like that thing that doesn't allow a top to be knocked over. It always can regain its balance, all right? It's why ships don't go over, the big cruise ships. Like, they've got a gyroscope. They actually keep it completely stable. It's why satellites stay in the air, all right? The gyroscope in our body allows us to always get back to our baseline of what it wants us to be. Now, our behavior can knock it off its center line, can knock ourselves off balance. But if you just ease up a little bit, okay, even a little bit, it'll start to immediately self-correct. And so that, so, so when you say this all or all in or all out, you know, those are extremes. Recognize that our body is always self-correcting. And if you give it even a little break, it'll let you start to self-correct. So even if you're a little in, that starts to make a difference. And if you're all in and you start to slip, you can go back and you can regain that pretty easily. Your body will actually start to self-correct. And you're not going for an extreme, honestly. What you're doing, even when you do extreme things, you're trying to hasten 
you're trying to make the resurrection of your balance a little bit faster. It is true. If you go all out and you really decide that you're, you know, you're going to screw yourself, you know, by embarking on dangerous behavior, you could knock that top over. But the moment you stop, it's going to start to right the ship again. I think that's a good, that's really good news. Secondly, if you then actually want to have a better chance of gaining balance, one thing to do is to just not do anything. You know, you kind of get that Zen state where you allow your body to reboot itself. Skip a meal, skip two meals, don't drink, exercise and just, and, and just be calm. Center yourself, don't do anything. That calmness, all right, no matter how it, what it takes for you to get calm, you know, even if you need to hug yourself, all those trauma and stress managing techniques can help you. Actually, your body start to reboot itself one of the most important reboots is when you're sleeping. Your body literally has a can have a hard restart, you know, control all delete and reboot itself if you get a really, really good night's sleep. That's why, by the way, you know, all of us in our lives, when we've actually had that incredible sleep and you get up and you feel really good, that's because you've rebooted. So that's the other thing, you know, like withhold anything for yourself, go empty for a little while, reboot, and you can actually be better. And the third thing I'll actually tell you is don't give up. You know, a lot of people who cycle, they wait cycle. They, I'm going to be really healthy. Oh, I can't do it anymore. I'm going to go on the other side. Now I'm going to be really healthy again. And your, your weight goes up and down. All right. Don't give up. You want to keep on moving towards that. I mean, studies have actually shown losing even a little weight. And by the way, weight is, most people think about weight as vanity. Here's what I think about. Weight is actually the harmful stuff inside your body cavity. You could be a big person, big body type, or you could be a thin person, you can still have extra body fat inside you. It's like extra peanuts you pack into a FedEx container. You could really overstuff that, that container, skinny container, tape it shut, duct tape it shut. It'll still be a skinny container, but it's bursting on the inside. What is it bursting like? Bursting like the inside when you grow too much harmful body fat? It's like a baseball glove wrapped around your organs, choking your organs. That's why you want to not overload on your fuel. That's why you want to get good sleep. That's why you want to lower your stress. You want to stay physically active and you want to make good choices. And anybody should know that your body wants to go there. That's your harmonious set point. And so I think no matter who you are, taking even the first baby steps to get there, it really is the first step to the end of your journey. Yeah. It's, it's so important because at the end of the day, we all do want to feel well. We all want to, we want to be like comfortable with who we are as far as our health and how we look physically. But at the end of the day, I think a lot of people are just so overwhelmed. They don't know where to start. They think they have to change everything overnight. And like we've talked about, like, that's just not the way it has to be. And I think the, the other thing I will add is that other than the amazing points that you brought up are that when you can learn to embrace like the journey and the process and knowing that this isn't going to be like a, a 30 day thing. It's not going to be a 90 day thing. This is going to be a lifetime journey with your health and fitness and that there's going to be days where you don't feel good. There's going to be days where you don't eat well. There's going to be days you don't move as much and that's okay. I think what counts is, is that over time, if you continue to be consistent and you are consistently moving your body, you know, more days than not, and you're eating well on most days, what you'll find, it's kind of like the stock market. Over time, the line will go up and up and up. I'd have a, you know, some down days, but it'll go up again, down. Then over time, you'll see this trajectory of growth in your health and wellness. And the other thing I'll add is I think it's important for people to celebrate how far they've come and not how far they have to go because there's so many people, especially early on, they're looking at all the things they haven't achieved in their health and fitness journey, but they're not looking at some of the things they have achieved. Maybe it is that they haven't been eating as much fast food. They're not drinking as much, you know, regular soda. They're not, you know, skipping the days of the gym, whatever the case may be. And that can all be, you know, positive, you know, reinforcement, right, to continue on the journey. And you have to give credit to yourself. And, and I think the other thing that's helpful you know, in medicine, we call this reflection and looking at the past, we call it the retrospectoscope. You know, if you actually go back and look at where you started, you realize how far you've come and credit yourself from every little bit that you've actually done that's good for you going forward. I mean, that's really the progress you've made. You deserve that reward. And really, you know, like, and it makes actually taking the steps ahead a lot easier. What would you say would be like, five tips that you could share with the audience on how people can improve their diet quality? Yeah, happy to give you the five tips, but let me kind of frame this by saying there is so much negativity associated with food. 
I'm coming at this from a completely different perspective. I would say negativity was out there and also misperceptions and, and lack of accurate information. So I like to kind of in, turn the entire formula around and come at this with how do we not fear our food, number one. And number two, how do we actually use the facts and the science to really be able to inform uh, how we can embrace food instead? And, you know, this has to do with my background as a physician, as a scientist, and as somebody who's actually been involved with biotechnology and developing cancer treatments and diabetes treatments and treatments for blindness you know, for almost 30 years, the reality is, is that food, in fact, is really one of the most powerful healthcare interventions that we can do for ourselves. And five tips I will give you right up front that could be really useful is, and this is sort of, you know, really across the board for anyone who has to eat, which is everyone, I would give you the five general principles. Number one, stay hydrated because dehydration actually makes everything in your body work harder. And so if you want your food to work for you, you actually want to make sure your body has enough water content to be able to keep all those metabolic processes functioning really well. Number two, I would say eat what you like, but make sure that most of what you eat and the priority of where your head goes when you're choosing something, making good choices, really falls in the category of what we call plant-based foods, which is pretty broad. I mean, there are hundreds of foods that are plant-based and it doesn't have to be broccoli and kale. It could be beans, it could be mushrooms, it could be onions, it could be garlic, all the things that you think hark back to those traditional delicious recipes that came from the grandmothers of the Mediterranean, whether it's Italy or Greece or Spain or France or Asia, whether it's Japan or China or Thailand. I mean, all those delicious things that you might see in a menu. I want people to think about healthy eating as when you look at a menu or when you actually are shopping, look for the things in the produce section first or look for the things that actually have vegetables in them. They don't have to be the only thing, but if you use that as a kind of a filter, you're going to be doing something really good for you. That's the second thing. Third, I would say to the extent possible, avoid ultra processed foods. And we all have things that we like that we grew up with that are snacky type of foods. And we all have lives that take us in different places in our communities or around the world even. And we can't always get the healthiest food. But what I want to kind of like emphasize is if you can cut down, if not cut out, ultra processed foods, things that actually have lots of artificial preservatives, artificial colorings, artificial flavorings, you know, those are the things that actually taste pretty good and we're kind of addicted to from marketing and from our childhood. So you've got we've got legitimate reasons why we like these things because they taste pretty good. If you can cut down, if not cut out those things, that's actually going to tip your dietary pattern in your favor. The other thing that I would actually say that would be really helpful is to try to avoid foods with added sugars whenever you can. This is your regular soda. This is actually even your diet soda, which actually has artificial sweeteners added that mess up your gut health and your gut microbiome and actually throw your metabolism off kilter. But stay away from added sugar because we can get plenty of sugar from the regular foods we eat. But if you start stuffing candy bars, you know, the habit we'd had as kids, right? Halloween, get that pillow and stuff it like a gunny sack and go out there and peg out all night long. Look, that's a lot of artificial sugar. And even as adults, we wind up actually snacking that way unconsciously. And it actually overloads our metabolism. That's a fourth thing. And the fifth thing I would actually say is that I want to come back to beverages for a second. You know, besides water, there's two other beverages that I think are go-tos for health. And one is tea. Could be green tea. Could be oolong tea. Could be black tea. And the other one is coffee. Remarkably, you know, water, tea, and coffee are the go-tos for beverage and health. Now, what you add to them can make a big difference. But, you know, those are five general rules that I think will take anybody else towards the path of health. And by the way, you'll notice that I didn't give any absolutes and I didn't say things that are really unreasonable. So that's probably a good place to start. Yeah, I love that. And I would imagine that the five tips that you shared probably go in line with what you would recommend for somebody as far as a dietary pattern to follow for longevity. So I guess outside of making sure you're consuming a lot of plants, drinking plenty of water, limiting ultra processed foods, what are a few other like staples that you think people should include within like a dietary pattern if they want to increase their longevity? Right. Okay. So longevity means not only having more birthdays, but also having good quality of life 
along the way, right? So we want a good, healthy lifespan, not just a long lifespan. If you're gorked out, you know, at 100 years old, or you are blind 100 years old, that would not be worth it. So I think the key to longevity, and you know, this is such an important and popular topic, I think, and it's really driven by science. There's a lot of really exciting things about longevity. I want to make sure people don't forget that you want to, we want to actually be able to enjoy our lives even as we live longer. Nobody wants to add more miserable years to their life. All right. So having said that, what are the things that are important to us? And I'm going to give you some concrete food things, but I, you know, what you're going to hear me talk about is the framing. Cause I think a lot of times when we hear about nutrition or food is medicine, we hear about individual substances, individual foods, individual recommendations without getting the context. So I think context is important. How do we actually maintain good later years in our life if we want to expand them? Our brains need to work. We need good cognition. What does that require at a minimum? Our brains need to have good blood flow. So we need to protect our circulation. So foods that can actually help protect our circulation, keep our circulation going, are really helpful. Research has shown there's actually a natural chemical that's found in a lot of foods called ursolic acid that actually helps our blood vessel system stay healthy so we have better blood flow. Where do you get ursolic acid? It comes in chestnuts. It comes in fruit peel, which is found on dried fruits, which are a healthy way to actually get a lot of dietary fiber which feeds our gut microbiome, our healthy gut bacteria in our body. And healthy gut bacteria text messages our brain and helps us release social hormones. So we're happy to do the things and see the people that we happen to see. And so this is sort of like a little bit of a contextual idea of some of the foods that we can eat and the reasons why in order to be able to have a good, long, healthy life, I I think number one would be actually a good, having a, a brain working really well. Second one, just tell you is, you know, we want to be able to move. We want to actually, you know, you don't want to be wheelchair bound or paralyzed or or so weak we're unable to be independent or as independent as we possibly can. So we need our muscles to be able to function properly. Now, muscles are built and broken down on a daily basis, which is why, you know, young kids are so active and teenagers are working out. And, you know, why we actually try to encourage people to actually exercise is that, You know, use it or lose it is really absolutely true. So we want to use it. Well, in addition to just physically exercising, we need to be able to actually build our muscles. Now, how does our body build our muscles from the time we're born all the way until our advanced ages? Uses stem cells. Now, these are not the stem cells you would get at the strip mall injected into your knee, you know, or your for your tennis elbow or your shoulder. These are stem cells we were born with. And a lot of people don't know this, but humans do regenerate. We are actually formed of stem cells. When our mom's egg met our dad's sperm and we were just a ball of cells, all stem cells. And these stem cells that you will want from your jaw and our face and our ears and our livers and our hearts, we have a bunch left over when we're born, about 70 million leftover cells. They're packed away, kind of like on the shelves of Home Depot, you know, extra cans of paint. You can draw on them when you need to. And these stem cells actually will participate in building our muscle over time. So what are some of the foods that actually help us build, help our stem cells come out so they can help to regenerate things? Well, it turns out that extra virgin olive oil turns out to be really helpful for our stem cells. It protects our stem cells as we age. And not surprisingly, in the blue zones, those parts of the world where people live really to healthy, ripe old ages, over 100, for example, centenarians, they tend to eat olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, which by the way, comes from a plant. It's a plant-based healthy fat. Number two, there's another fat that you should know about that's found associated with protein. That's in seafood, and that's omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3s also help our stem cells regenerate. They prompt our body to stay renewed, which is important for aging. Where do you get omega-3s? Well, besides salmon and anchovies and mackerel and sardines, you hear about that a lot. It turns out many, many, many different kinds of seafoods and even seaweeds, actually edible seaweeds, actually have omega-3s. So one of the things that I write about in my new book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, is leaning into that seafood section of the grocery store, which You know, some people already like seafood, but some people aren't familiar. And I want to take people's apprehension away to say, dive in there because there's a lot of great stuff. That's a secret to longevity as well. It turns out 
in many of the blue zones and in many places where people live to a ripe old age, they eat reasonable amounts of seafood regularly. And not surprisingly, this omega-3 is found in there. Now, I'm going to throw one last kind of delight and surprise that can help your stem cells, which help to rebuild your brain and your heart and your muscles, actually is dark chocolate. Turns out chocolate's a candy. Okay, it's a confection. But to make dark chocolate, you have high amounts, 70%, 80%, 90% cacao. Cacao is actually from a seed pod, the cacao plant. And that's a plant-based food. It turns out there's natural chemicals, bioactives in cacao made in dark chocolate at high concentrations that help our stem cells come out and rebuild our muscles, our circulation, many other parts that need to be renewed. And as we get older, one of the things we want to do is we want to continuously be renewed rather than broken down. These are some of the ways that we think about diet and longevity. Those are some great tips and some great foods. As you were naming those foods, I was like, yep, definitely eat that. Yep, definitely eat that. And it just seems like it's pretty consistent too with uh, like the Mediterranean dietary pattern, right? Would you say that that's pretty accurate? Absolutely. And here's the thing that I think is really important to understand about the Mediterranean diet. As you said, that it's a pattern. It's not a single recipe or a single commercial package. The Mediterranean is not just Italy and Greece and Spain, which people can pick out in two seconds. But in fact, it's made up of like 27 different countries that all surround the Mediterranean Sea. And most people don't realize this, but Tunisia and Israel, Croatia are all Mediterranean countries. And what that means is that there's a really rich diversity of traditional foods that people have enjoyed. So, you know, for people that say, well, you know, I'm not really into Italian food or I'm not really, I don't know who could, wouldn't be into Italian food, but you know, some people are very picky with their food. What I say is that if you want to look at Mediterranean pattern, you have to appreciate this is more than 20 different countries that have something to offer for you. And similarly, Mediterranean is one pattern of healthy eating, but the other pattern of healthy eating is in Asia because Asians live, uh, there's a long pattern of longevity, it's traditional patterns, lots of seafood, lots of plant-based foods. And here's the cool thing, Doug, is that the Mediterranean in Asia, if you think about restaurant menus, might look like there couldn't be more differences, but then two different types of cuisine. But in fact, the pattern of eating and the things that are in them could not be more connected because 2,000 years ago, there was something called the Silk Road, and it was a series of dusty trails that linked China to the Mediterranean. And the traders that did trade silk, but many other things as well, also exchanged their ingredients and recipes. And so when you want to think about healthy patterns of eating, please do think about Mediterranean eating and realize that Mediterranean is much more than Italian food. It's a lot of different foods. But now I want you to actually open this up to a kaleidoscope of cuisine that includes Asia and the interconnections between Mediterranean and Asia. And I actually, in my new book, I call this Mediterranean because it really is something that is not new, but thousands of years old. And now it's time for us to kind of really go back and tap that well of culinary genius that's always existed. And the stuff tastes great too. And staying on the theme of eating certain foods that can improve our overall quality of life, we talked about olive oil, you talked about seafood that contains omega-3s, you talked about dark chocolate. I know that you're a big fan of polyphenols as well. So I think this would be a good kind of segue to talk about like why you're such a fan of them, what exactly they do, and what are some foods that contain them? First of all, polyphenols are a research term that describe hundreds of thousands of natural chemicals that are out there. So it's sort of a blanket term for many of these natural chemicals that Mother Nature put into food. Now, these chemicals, I call them Mother Nature's pharmacy, not with a pH, pharmacy, but actually with an F as in farm. Let's see, because these are the things that farmers have been growing, part of our agriculture and a lot of our plant-based foods. Now, polyphenols by themselves are pretty amazing if you study what they can actually do. They're antioxidant. They can activate epigenetic changes that help our DNA perform better. You know, and there's a lot of popular information out there about polyphenols, and I'm telling you, they're present in many, many different types of foods, including the ones, all the ones we've talked about so far. 
But I will also tell you that when it comes to food and health and polyphenols, it's not just about the food and their polyphenols. It's about how our body responds to the polyphenols that you would ingest. So I'm going to tell you, I've done research looking at how we stay healthy. And it turns out that our health is not just a passive state of being, but in fact, the reason we're healthy is the result of our own body's hardwired health defense systems. We've got five of them, angiogenesis, angio blood vessels, how our body grows our circulation. Talked about how important that is for longevity in our brain. Number two, stem cells, regeneration. We regenerate all the time, which is why we're still around tomorrow, is that we are regenerating ourselves today. We talked about stem cells growing our muscles, also really important. Polyphenols activate that as well. Our gut microbiome, we touched on that earlier today as well. Polyphenols actually help to groom the healthy gut bacteria that represents part of our ecosystem. This ecosystem of our gut bacteria controls our immunity, helps us lower inflammation, helps our metabolism, and our healthy gut bacteria techs our brain, as I mentioned earlier, to release social hormones. And so polyphenols that help our gut microbiome, our gut health are absolutely critical. Polyphenols also are antioxidant, as I mentioned. They protect our DNA from damage that can happen. Now, most people say, well, why do I need to worry about my DNA? Well, because healthy DNA is responsible for healthy you, healthy proteins, healthy cells, and unhealthy DNA is mutations. And mutations are the reason, the root cause, why we develop cancer. And so that's why you want to be careful and why you care about it. And if you don't fix your DNA, repel the incoming missiles that are trying to develop, damage your DNA from the environment, you actually wind up actually being at a greater risk for being mutated. And we're not talking about the X-Men. We're talking about the average cancer patient that's out there. Nobody wants to be that person. And if you are someone who's dealt with cancer, you don't want to get it again. And so this is really why polyphenols can be important for DNA. And by the way, one other thing, polyphenols slow down the fuse that involves DNA that burn down on the end of our cells. So, you know, it's like the Mission Impossible, strike a match, light the fuse, the fuse starts burning down. Well, that's really our lifespan. As our DNA starts to wear down and burn down, our life gets shorter and our cellular health, our longevity gets shorter and shorter. So polyphenols slow the burn and in some cases can make the fuse longer again, which is cellular longevity. And that counts as well. And the fifth thing that polyphenols do, and it's part of our health defenses, is they light up our immune defenses. We know that you know a good immune system protects us from the common cold and other viruses that might be out there. So you ask a very simple question, why do I care about polyphenols? And I'm saying that Look, polyphenols activate our health defenses. And when our health defenses are activated, we stay healthier longer and are able to repel disease. And so many people, they end up starting something when it comes to their nutrition, they stop, they end up not starting something because they don't have the confidence to be able to make that transformation or whatever the case may be. And they end up not making these changes and they don't in turn embrace a lot of the information that's out there about nutrition, diet, and how it can actually be super beneficial for your health. In your opinion, though, as a doctor, even in your own experience, maybe just experience and talking to, to friends and colleagues, like, why do you think most diets fail? Yeah. Well, I, you know, first of all, I love the fact we're having this conversation on a show called The Adversity Advantage, because adversity is actually how many of us have come to view food and our diet, right? And so you go on a diet to fight something else in your life that you're not happy with. And so then food becomes actually your enemy, your foe, your opponent, or the patterns of eating become that. So, you know, when you say, why don't diets actually tend to work? It has to do with the fundamental nature of why people think they need to go on a diet to begin with. And this is really kind of like the basis of my new book, Eat to Beat Your Diet. It's a trick title. It's not a diet book. In fact, it's an anti-diet book that teaches you how the science of the new science of our body, the new science of our metabolism, I'm a scientist and a doctor, teaches us that we don't really have to suffer. We don't have to go on these yo-yo diets. We don't have to swing to extremes in order to really be able to use food or de grapple with food not as our opponent, but really as our collaborator. And not just to be able to help us lose weight and feel better, but literally to be able to bring us joy as well. So if I told you that this topic of food and your metabolism and health 
is the antithesis of adversity. It's about harmony. And the question is, the question we're talking about is, how do you turn something that appears to be an ad adversary into a situation where you can really embrace the harmony? I think that's the modern conversation about diets. Absolutely. But I think it's easier said than done because I think that when pe a lot of people are starting to make the change to eat healthier, it's in the midst of adversity in their life, right? They, maybe they just got some bad news from a doctor. Maybe they went through a divorce and they're like, you know what, like I'm going to get that revenge body or maybe they had some health scare in the family or whatever the case may be. And their stress levels are, are high. They're overwhelmed. They're seeing all this information online about this diet and that diet and try this and lose 30 pounds in three weeks and all this information that we see now. And I love what you said about it being coming to a place of harmony, because at the end of the day, it's going to actually help you in so many ways. And it's going to bring you more peace with yourself and in your lifestyle. If I were a patient of yours, and I would say, you know, Dr. Lee, I'm looking to I'm eating nothing but processed foods right now, my life is a complete mess. Like, what are some initial steps that I could take to make sure that I'm in this for the long run? Yeah, that's, you know, and that's not a uncommon situation, right? I mean, so many people, either articulate and acknowledge or they are living with this sort of in a little shadow recognition in the back of their minds that they're not they're not living their best lives and how they feel both physically and emotionally actually is a consequence of that but they don't know how to get out of that rut right so what i would tell you doug you know if you were see coming to me as a patient with what i know is i would say first of all there's some natural temptation to grasp at something that seems like a silver bullet. And whether that's a supplement that's being sold to you, uh, a super beverage, a super food, or a program diet that some guru is trying to tell you, even if you hear your friends talking about it, you know, like we're human. So we, we tend to gravitate towards, you know, like what's going on and who's doing it. And if you have friends that are doing it, you kind of want to jump on there. That's why we've got keto. That's why we had Atkins and South Beach. And, you know, you name the diet. That's basically why people jump onto these ships. But I would argue that people who go onto diets need to really take a moment before jumping at that and grasping at that straw. You know, it's like you might feel like you're on the Titanic going down. All right. You'll take any life raft that you think is nearby. All right. But let me tell you, diets and the healthy way to use food is highly, highly individualized. It has to do with who we each are. So the best thing I would tell you, Doug, is first, if you were looking for help, I would have this conversation with you to say, let's take a look at your individual self. Let's take a look at what your preferences are, your needs, okay? Let's have a level of self-actualization, self-knowledge that you need to understand what makes you tick, why you actually are even interested in a diet, and what are your goals, all right? If your goals are more energy to kind of be renewed, to be regenerated as somebody, and, you, and your goal is to really kind of step further and further away from a path that you think is going to lead to disease, then I've got some good news for you. And the good news is that while we used to think you have to go on these extreme elimination diets that are really loaded with value judgments, don't do this, don't do that, it makes you feel bad, you know, like food and fat are all kind of like these bad kind of ideas. The new science teaches us something completely different and really kind of surprising. And this is what I write about in my new book, Eat to Beat Your Diet First, that we are all hardwired with all the operating system we need to be able to have a really, really good metabolism. And when we have a good metabolism, we've got good energy, we've got good use of the calories that we're taking and all the other micronutrients that we're actually eating and that we're actually fueling up our body's own health defenses. These health defenses not just make us feel better, they do make us feel better, give us more energy, all right? But they also protect us against chronic diseases like diabetes and heart disease and cancer and all the specters of health that people are a little bit afraid of when they go to the doctor's office, like, oh man, I hope I, they don't give me bad news. And what I'm telling you is that this is not fate. There is actually your own destiny is hardwired in your body. So how do we unleash our inner metabolism to allow our body to do the things that it wants to do? And you don't need to actually do elimination and restriction. Instead, it's sort of understanding how to get in harmony with yourself, not just what to eat, we, we can talk about that, but how to eat and when to eat become really, really important things. 
So don't just go pick up a bottle or a can or a jar of powder or, you know, start copycatting what somebody else says you need to do every day. Let's first think about what your own goals are. What are the things that are dogging you that you want to actually overcome? And then what we do is we actually realign that with how your body actually works. And then how do you choose foods and eat mindfully to be able to get there? Yeah, I love that. And I think now that you we've kind of identified that, you know, for people trying to lose weight, become healthier, whatever their main goal is, the approach that really counts is the one that they're going to stick to and the one that's best for them individually. And then along the same lines as goals, you know, I've heard a lot of people talk about, and I believe this myself, that you have to have some level of emotion tied to whatever it is you're trying to achieve so that it just helps you not just stick to it, but when things get tough, you kind of remember why you started. And, and I'm sure there's other reasons to go along with that. What is your take on that? And what's your advice based on your take on how somebody can really get deeply connected to the goal they're trying to achieve? Yeah. Well, this has to do with harmony, right? And harmony is inner harmony. Like when it comes to health, it's really about what's inside us. And I think too many of us and maybe our society today is so externally focused, checklist focused, task focused, maybe even kind of financial goal focused or, or advancement focused. And so what we forget about in this sort of busy, crazy rush of our modern lives and by the way, it's also not helped by our mobile devices that we're scrolling on. And first of all, there's a lot of incredible things that our technology, digital technology gives to us. But one of the things it doesn't give to us is it does not hand us the permission slip to be able to have a moment of peace and rest and reflection. And, you know, in fact, we're, we're continuously bombarded with new information on a moment to moment basis that takes us further and further away from ourselves. So back to sort of like this idea of internal harmony, what makes me happy? What do I want to aim for in my life? Like, how do I know? And how will I know when I get there? You know, what are those kinds of fundamental things? Knowing yourself is one of the both easiest and hardest things to do. And I, what I'm telling you is before you pick up any food, before you start any workout, before you do any type of therapy, this is a kind of the, the moment of truth, self-truth, self-knowledge, self-awareness that I think all of us have the ability to be able to kind of reach for. Now, is there trauma and pain that, that many of us will encounter when we do that? Yes, but that actually is also equally the secret in to be able to actually solve that problem. Otherwise, it's always gonna be a hidden bump in the road that we're actually not gonna be able to overcome. And so this whole, whole emotional centeredness, this uh, idea of knowing who we are and what our goals are and what makes us tick. And by the way, even when it comes to food, and I write about this extensively, you know, most people who are trying to lose weight or let's call it better fitness for the lack of a better word. I mean, losing weight loss is a very specific thing, but better fitness is a goal that everyone has, even if you're trying to lose weight. Okay. How are you actually living your life today? You know, taking stock of how, what you're actually doing to yourself, because the good news is that there may be some things that you are doing naturally that are actually quite good for you. You just don't know it. You're not, you're not keeping score. And so what I, my research is showing is that you know, elevating our health to a better level using the, our metabolism and using the defense health defense systems that are hardwired inside us is actually hidden in plain sight. We have to start at the beginning to be able to understand what our own inner goals are first. And then taking one step at a time allows us to unpack the path to get to better health. I love what you just said about taking one step at a time and then also acknowledging that you know, in a perfect world, there, there wouldn't be all these stressors and there wouldn't be trauma and pain that sometimes could hinder our ability to see results and get results and continue along the path. Because I know that that gets in the way of a lot of goals when they're looking to achieve something is like the daily stressors in their lives and stuff that happens at work and so on and so forth. And I think that also goes along with, I think one of the biggest problems I know for me, when I'm stressed, I know food sometimes can become a crutch for me where I tend to eat worse when I'm feeling stressed, I eat more when I'm feeling stressed. So just using me, I guess, as an example, again, you know, if I was coming to you and I just said, Dr. Lee, you know, I'm just having trouble like overeating specifically when I'm stressed. I just find myself like reaching for junk food, processed food when I'm having a hard time. What kind of advice would you, you know, give me to help counter that? Again, your internal hardwired operating system 
is always available for you to tap into to be able to get to better balanced health. So no matter how far away you are from that goal, you can do it. All right. That's the first thing I'd tell you. I would tell you that in order to do that, though, you need to realize that in addition to the food choices that you make, we can talk about junk food and, and all that stuff. But I want to also talk about the un, some of the underlying causes of stress. If you don't deal with that, it can be a problem. I mean, research studies have actually shown, come back a little bit into this whole idea of trauma and anger and anxiety, and the emotional aspect of it, is that studies have shown that if you take a look at, there's a study done of women who looked at women who were overweight or obese and looked at and correlated with their level of anger. And it turns out that the, those people who actually had more difficulty with their metabolism and with their body weight were also people who had tended to have more repressed and unresolved deep anger. And so, you know, and I want to call that out as an as a extreme example because we're all stressed from things. Life is stressful. That's just the nature of it. And most of us have a decent amount of resiliency to deal with the occasional traffic stop or, you know, you forgot your keys or whatever, you know, it's like we bounce back from that stuff. But when you actually hold on to anger, deep anger, that's really kind of to get into that trauma realm. And then you really have a hard time letting go. That needs to be worked on. That needs to be worked on because it's going to interfere with almost everything else that you would try to do. So I could talk to you about how to time your eating, how to make better food choices, the volume to eat. Like I want to talk to you about all that because that's important. But, you know, back to this basic line, if you are actually having something really fundamental that you're just not dealing with at all, that internal self, you're going to have a hard time moving forward in this path no matter what. So I, I think I'm glad you brought this up as an early point. You know, we've got to actually confront ourselves as a very fundamental part of actually moving forward. That said, I can tell you there's some basic ground rules to actually clear up your body and allow your inner metabolism and your health defenses to rise to their own water level. And that's the good news because it means your body wants to do this. We're humans. We want to do this. All right. So one of the natural things to think about is understanding our metabolism. And a big surprise is in the last two years alone, just 24 months, it's been discovered that human metabolism works in a way that is completely different than we thought for the last hundred years. It turns out that we're not born with a slow metabolism or a fast metabolism. And that means that we're not destined to fight with food and body fat and obesity the way that we always have talked about. You know, oh, my sister's so lucky she was born with a fast metabolism. That's why she's skinny as a stick and can eat anything. And me, on the other hand, I was born with a slow metabolism. So I've struggled my whole life with my weight and I have to be careful with what I eat, right? How many times have we heard that? I mean, a lot of people carry around that. It turns out that's not true. We are all born with the exact same metabolism, that operating system, the hardwiring of our energy, of our metabolism, using fuel to give us energy and power up our system and power up our health is actually exactly the same. The four phases of metabolism we go through at any given point in your life, and this is important because if you're coming to me at you haven't hit middle age yet or you're just getting to middle age, you're in a meta metabolic stage that it's important to understand. So the first stage is zero to one years old. Your metabolism skyrockets to 50% higher than it's going to be when you're an adult, phase one. Phase two, from one year old to 20 years old, your metabolism goes down, 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 down. Now, why is that important and a surprise? Because most people who are parents will know that when their kids are teenagers and they're sprouting up like a beanstalk and they're eating two or three dinners and they're bouncing off the wall and they're full of energy, we always used to think that, oh man, the kids are getting, their metabolism is going up wrong. Their metabolism is going down, 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 down to adult levels. And then from age 20 to 60, and I know that you're somewhere in between there, Doug, all right? Your metabolism is hardwired to be rock stable. This is what your body wants to do, not to change one bit. So your energy level should be up in healthy, full-blown levels because that, that's how your operating system is. Now, obviously, people's metabolism do shift, and I'll explain why. But 20 to 60 is exactly the same, and that means that if you actually allow your metabolism to do what it wants to do, 60 can be the new 20. And that's an important thing because this is right through your first child, your second child, your menopause, your 40s and 50s and 60s, you know, your life changes. 
everything is completely your metabolism is rock solid and then finally your last stage stage four is from 60 onwards to like 90 your metabolism declines about 17 percent before you get to the end all this means to tell you that this new science teaches us how we're hardwired and when you actually throw extra body fat into the equation what happens, it's not a slow metabolism causes you to gain body fat and, and more weight. It's that extra body fat throws rocks at your metabolism and crushes your metabolism. So you do want to actually fight body fat, harmful excess body fat, but it's really for inner health. It's not about vanity. It's really about how do you get, you know, that question you asked me, what do I do? What I would say is you want your metabolism to rise. You want your health defenses to rise. And one of the things you want to do is a streamline, allow your metabolism to do what it was designed to do. So along those lines, like how do we optimize our metabolism? Like what are some foods that you think we can eat? How should we eat? What types of activities should we be doing every single day? that you found to be useful in like, optimizing the metabolism? Well, you know, the first thing I sort of want to share is an explanation uh, of what is metabolism, because I think this is a term that everyone thinks they know something about, but I'm telling you, there's a new science of the metabolism that is changing the way that we understand everything. And, and it's so new that some of the information is less than two years old. The old textbooks are still being ripped up and thrown out the window. The new ones haven't even been written yet. So we're talking about some real cutting edge stuff. The first point is that our metabolism, as a scientist, I could throw a lot of very, very complicated scientific terms at you, but I'm not going to do it. Your metabolism is your body system to be able to use fuel in your body to run your body's engines. Just like if you have a car and you have an engine that makes that makes the car run, you have to put fuel into the car, okay, in order to be, to be able to run that engine. So in a car, when you're driving and you look at the fuel gauge and the, the tank was running low, what do you do? You turn, pull over to the gas station and you pull out and fill up the tank. When the tank is full, the nozzle clicks, put it back, and then you drive off. Our body is the same way. When our engines are running, it's our metabolism, how to use that en energy and fuel. When our fuel tank runs low, our fuel gauge runs low, it's in our brain and it's hardwired in our muscles and our organs. When it runs low, what do we do? We don't go to a filling station. We pull over to the dinner table. We pull over to the restaurant. We pull over to the snack bar, to the refrigerator, to the pantry. All right. And what are we doing? We are actually getting fuel. So just like fueling up your car. So when we actually pick up fuel to put into our body, think about the analogy I just gave you with a car and fuel. Good quality fuel that you put into your car or your gas tank is going to make your engine run a lot longer. Your car could take a crappy low quality gas once or two, twice, you know, when you're filling that's all that's available, right? To get you back on the road. But if you actually continuously put low quality fuel, crappy quality fuel, and you started to have contaminated gasoline into that fuel, whether it's contaminated with chemicals or sugar or whatever else it is, you will actually destroy your engine over time. Same deal when it comes to food in our engine. Our food is our fuel, our, our body, our metabolism runs that en energy and the quality makes all the difference in the world. Now I wanna talk about some specific foods that help our metabolism run really, really well. But in addition to one way to, that I wanna say about how do we wreck our metabolism, Okay, is just using the same analogy as the gas station. Now, imagine you go to the, pull up to the filling station with your car and you put the nozzle in your gas tank, the gas tank is full, and normally the nozzle clicks when the gas tank is full and it's not gonna fill anymore, no more gas comes out. And you pull it out and you're good to go. Our body doesn't have a clicker. So when we sit down to put fuel in our body and you say overeating, all right, that's what we're doing. Where there's no clicker, we're just continuing to shove food into our body. Now, what happens when you're actually at a filling station if your gas tank were to overflow? All right, it would run down the side out of the tank, down the side of the car, around the wheels. It would pool around your feet, and you'd be standing in this flammable, toxic, dangerous mess, right? And you would hope that the air, you'd have to walk away, and the air would evaporate the gasoline, right? Now, we don't have the same luxury when we eat. When we eat and we overeat, what we're doing is we are overloading the tanks in our body and our body has to put that extra fuel somewhere. It can't evaporate. So what our body does is it takes extra fuel and it stuffs it into our fat, our fat cells. Our fat cells are normal fuel tanks, all right? So when we have 
When we eat, we're using the energy. Anything extra gets stored into little fat cells. Fat cells get bigger, bigger, bigger. All right. And then if you're eating normal amounts, it'll store some extra energy. Then when you're done eating, it'll burn down that fuel. Now, if you actually continuously actually overload the gas tank, you're going to fill up that fat fuel tank. It's going to be blisteringly big, like a water balloon. And then guess what? Your body says, we still got more fuel. You overate. Now you got to make more fat cells, fuel tanks, and it's going to fill those up. And that gets filled up. Now you got to make another one and it's going to fill up. And now you kind of see why over putting too much fuel in our body causes us to actually gain extra body fat. That extra body fat is like a toxic mess that are standing in that gasoline, that overfloated gas tank is like. It's flammable. It's inflammation, which is like flame inside our body. That sets us up for a big problem. The good news about that is we can actually eat less. So being mindful that that's how our body works, you eat less is really, really helpful. So I always tell people, eat, stop eating when you feel satisfied, but before you feel full. And if you eat slower, your stomach will signal, text message your brain to tell you like when it's actually naturally full. The other thing you can do that would be incredibly important to actually keep your metabolism going well is not to eat too close to bedtime and not to eat too close to getting up in the morning. Because when we are actually eating food, there's a, a hormone called insulin that our pancreas, our body produces, and insulin works to draw that food fuel as energy into our cells. That's what insulin does, all right? And when our insulin is up, it's the signal in our body is our metabolisms that store the fuel, baby. Don't burn it, store it. We wanna gobble it all up and pack it away, all right? It's like ammo for energy. When our insulin is down, which is when we're not eating, our metabolism shifts gears and says, all right, Time to per tap into the fuel. So if you want to burn that extra fuel that's stored in your tanks, which is your fat cells, you might have extra fat from overeating yesterday or overeating the last week or the last month or from the holidays, whatever it is, your celebration, all right? The fact is that you could, your body is actually hardwired to burn that down, but it only burns it down when you are not eating because the insulin goes down and your metabolism shifts gears to actually be in fat burning mode. This happens when we're sleeping, naturally, by the way. And when we're sleeping, we're not eating. By the way, another name for that is fasting, which is why when we get up in the morning and we have our coffee and our eggs or whatever, it's called breakfast. Breakfast is breaking your overnight fast, break fast. All right. And so when what you hear about uh, intermittent fasting, isn't just a trend, isn't kind of like this crazy, you know, new way of actually living your life. It's how our body's hardwired to do it every single day. When you're sleeping, you're fasting. When you're fasting, your insulin's down. When your insulin's down, your metabolism goes, shoop, let's go ahead and start burning down extra fuel. All right. So if you don't eat too close to bedtime, like when you stop eating, okay, let's say you go to bed at 11 and you get up at seven in the morning. That's eight hours of sleep. I strongly recommend that as a generally good optimal amount of time of sleep to get cleans your brain it gets rid of the toxins it actually resets your immune system all kinds of things calm stress lowers inflammation good quality eight hours of sleep now let's say that you eat dinner so you go to bed from 11 and get up at seven eight hours let's say that you eat dinner at seven o'clock in the evening all right and for most people let's say that you finish eating at around eight an hour later you put their dishes away in the sink at eight o'clock all right now, how many of us actually eat a little snack later? We go for some dessert. We're before bedtime. I got to eat one more thing. All right. Don't want to do that because every time you do that close to bedtime, you're spiking your insulin. When the insulin goes up, your metabolism isn't able to burn fat. If you stop eating when you put your dishes in the sink. So let's say that you eat dinner at seven, you stop eating at eight, put your dishes in the sink, no more food. That's it. Okay, you'll get used to it. It'll be cool. Don't worry. All right. You've given, and you go to bed at 11, from 8 to 11, you've given your body three extra hours. You've given your metabolism the gift of three extra hours to burn down that extra fuel that's gotten stuck and trapped in your body. And if you get up at seven in the morning, rather than roll out of bed and do what, you know, our mommies told us to do when we were kids, hurry up and eat breakfast so you can get on the school bus and go to school on time. All right. If you get up and said, let's say it's seven, Take a shower, get dressed, check your emails, read a book, read a newspaper, whatever it is you're going to do. Go for a walk. 
an hour later, you sit and have a breakfast. You've given your body, your metabolism, the gift of an extra hour in the morning that you burn down fuel. So let's do some math. Three hours after, after the dishes are in the sink before bedtime, plus eight hours of sleeping time, that's 11 hours, plus one extra hour before you actually sit down and eat breakfast. It's reasonable to do. Anybody can actually do that, honestly. But do the math, three plus eight plus one. Now it's 12 hours. You've given your body 50% of your life is spent towards streamlining your metabolism by burning down that extra body fat. That's how you allow your inner metabolism to start to rise to the surface. So without actually having to even go on any kind of crazy diet, any fads, any elimination, you can just kind of use that timing and of course the amount to eat, like always leave some white space on your plate, don't go back for seconds and quit the clean plate club. That's a way with before we even talk about what are some good choices to add that you can actually use your body to fight on your behalf. I know that one of the things that's really important for our gut is fiber. And it seems like based on the dietary patterns that you're talking about and recommending, these plant heavy diets are going to contain a lot of fiber naturally. If you could explain like why high fiber diets are so important for people and maybe some potential dangers that can happen if people don't eat enough fiber. Okay. So when we eat something with dietary fiber, let me give you an example. It could be a celery stock, but I'll tell you something that doesn't seem very fibrousy, which is a pear. Pear doesn't seem like it has a lot of fiber, but it's got six grams of dietary fiber, a lot of dietary fiber. And when we eat a pear, we're absorbing our, you know, sort of an upper gut, all the polyphenols and the vitamins and all these great bioactives. And then what the trickle down is to the lower part of our gut is the dietary fiber, right? That's the quote roughage. Now, what we don't absorb goes down the pike of our gut to feed our bacteria. So the roughage we eat, the dietary fiber, actually is the food that we feed our gut microbiome. Now, if you've got a pet, if you've got a dog, a cat, parakeet, goldfish, you are almost certainly conscientious in feeding your pets every single day. And, you know, many people think about, you know, what's the best food I should be feeding them because you care about them and they pay you back, right, with affection and, you know, to help lower stress. Well, this is the same thing with our gut bacteria. If we mindfully feed our pet gut bacteria that lives inside us, by the way, the number of human cells we are made out of is about 40 trillion human cells. And the number of gut bacteria that lives inside us is 39 trillion. So we're almost one to one with our bacteria. We got to feed those guys and we provide them room and board, which is what we're feeding them. And they pay us back for that by releasing these signals and hormones that control our metabolism. They help us use glucose better so we have enough energy and we don't develop pre-diabetes and active diabetes. They help us heal our wounds faster. So when we were cut or we have surgery, we heal up faster. They help us um, control the amount of body fat that we have. I mean, like you and I sitting here, we might not look like we have a lot of extra body fat, but actually, I'll tell you, you don't have to look big to have a lot of dangerous body fat packed inside a thin frame. They call this, you know, lean obesity. And there's dangerous fat called visceral fat that can be packed around your organs like a baseball mitt holding your kidneys and your heart and your liver. That kind of fat actually predates all kinds of chronic diseases. And good, healthy gut fights that as well, it's in addition to all the things that, that are good for our mental health and wellness as well. So what I'm saying is that when we feed our gut properly, it pays us back with all these benefits in all different aspects of our health. And when our gut is unhealthy and damaged, all right, what happens is that bad bacteria overgrow good bacteria. The bad bacteria don't, don't give us all those benefits. And then what happens is that all those functions start to fall apart. Our metabolism goes haywire. Our blood sugars rise. We get prediabetes. Our wounds don't heal as well. Our immune system goes down. And then mentally, we start getting more agitated as well. You know, it's interesting. Dysbiosis, which is a problem of our gut bacteria, has been connected to depression, schizophrenia, even autism. And so this connection between our gut and our brain is so profound 
that it really represents one of the new next frontiers of medical research. And that's really why the simple thing that everyone needs to know about who's watching and listening to this is that, you know, if you have a cat and a dog and you're feeding your cat and your dog, just remember you got gut bacteria too. Feed them well, give them some dietary fiber. They will thank you for it and you'll actually be healthier overall. And I know what you've said that you don't like to speak in absolutes in terms of diet, but it seems that you're big on fiber, you're big on vegetables, and there's a lot of information out there, I guess, online where people are seeing that it's super healthy to be fully carnivore and you know, have your diet com composed of mostly red meat and that vegetables are bad. Like, What do you say to people that believe that? Yeah, look, I tell people I'm a scientist, and the interesting thing about science is that it builds upon itself with evidence. And you look for new discoveries that help us understand something better. And sometimes the new discoveries build on the old discoveries and make you more certain that something is a truth, right? And of course, there are lots of ideas out there online. And I think the issue about diet and nutrition and philosophy about food, you know, there is a true science of nutrition and food as medicine. And then food and nutrition also has sort of this very emotional component to it, psychological component to it, where it's almost like a religion. You know, you believe in a God of religion, a, a belief, a, a philosophy, a school of thought, and either you're for it or you're against it. Well, that's not how science works. And so I can only speak as a scientist. All of the evidence has accumulated to date with real hard scientific evidence has shown that fruits and vegetables, nuts and grains and seeds, healthy oils, seafoods actually overall are good for you. OK, you know, there's caveats, of course, but, you know, and you can always overdo things. But overall, that's a healthy pattern. Listen, I'm not, a, you know, you've mentioned a carnivore diet. I'm not against red meat. I'm actually not a vegan. I'm not a vegetarian, but I eat mostly vegetables. I would say I'm probably like an 80 percent vegetarian. I'm a very reasonable guy and I actually enjoy food. I enjoy the tradition. I'm kind of a foodie. I'll eat some meat every now and then, but I really don't think the evidence shows that eating a mostly red meat diet is good for you. In fact, I'll tell you, it's quite the opposite. Most of the evidence is that if you eat heavy proteins, red meat, high in saturated fats, and then, you know, you can even go to keto and other sources where you have a lot of butter and all that kind of stuff. All the evidence shows that over the long haul, that dietary pattern does not pay off in good health. You might really enjoy that ribeye, you know, finished off with some melted butter, all right. But I can tell you that if you do that every single day for year after year, your body will pay for that. So I think more of a concept of understanding where the body of health lies, being uh, practicing moderation. And you know what? If you really like to eat something, this is the kind of doctor I am. I'm not about absolutes. Talk to me. Tell me what it is that, that really matters to you. I'm okay kind of coaching you a little bit on like, okay, you can have a little bit of that, but just make sure that you don't have too much of it. Spend more time thinking about the good stuff and there'll be less room for the things that aren't so good for you. And you can treat yourself occasionally. I'm, I'm okay with that. Yeah. It just seems like the, the main thing somebody can do to improve the function of their metabolism is to lose excess body fat. And the best way to do that without necessarily going on a specific diet or focusing on specific foods is to just eat less than you are now and finding creative ways to do that. One of them being almost like the time restricted feeding window, like you said, almost like you don't eat past a certain time. You eat like an hour after you get up or something like that. In my book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, I call it, once you realize what time you finish dinner and what time you eat breakfast, you can set your own, it's like an alarm on your watch or your phone. You can set the time you're gonna open your eating window in the morning Okay. And you can set what time you're going to close the eating window. So you're not going to eat anymore. Right. And you can even set an alarm on your phone if you need a, a reminder. But actually, you know, if you realize that the time that you're not eating after you put the dishes away, your body's actually starting to shift into gear to start to streamline your metabolism. That's kind of an awareness. You can't unlearn that. Like once you hear that, then next time you want to reach for that brownie or that piece of cake or whatever it is, bag of chips, like some voice in your head is going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want to be interfering with my body right now. My body actually wants to do something. You, Another part of your brain might be saying, go ahead and eat it, right? That's the, the angel and the devil kind of on both shoulders, warring with your brain. But again, this is where I think you, by understanding what your goals are, you realize that your body wants to help you 
it's trying to help you. It's there for you, man. Like it's got your back. And so by putting that in your head, it's, a, it's an easy thing. Now you want to take that to the next level. And this is what I write about in my new book, Eat to Beat Your Diet. What's really cool is that during the time you're eating, it turns out that food doesn't always grow fat. In fact, the research has shown some foods actually during the day, even when your insulin is up, some foods will actually cause your body to fight extra body fat and streamline your metabolism while you're eating. So just now before I was telling you when insulin is up, when you're eating, your body's metabolism is all about storing the food and not burning it. And when you're not eating and your insulin is down, it'll actually start to burn the fuel. There's an exception to that rule. And that's if you choose and I wrote about 150 different foods proven by human studies, research studies, that when you eat them in moderation, these foods and the natural chemicals contained in them will fire up your metabolism so you can eat to lose and burn down extra body fat so you can streamline your metabolism. That to me is a really amazing thing because it's good news. You can choose foods. I mean, who would have thought you can eat foods to lose weight? It doesn't make sense, right? Yes, it does. The science teaches us and the clinical studies show us it can be actually done. So the first step is to just focus on eating less and like identifying those windows that you're going to eat throughout the day. And then the second thing after you've mastered that is now to like look at like what you're eating within that time frame. And out of those 150 foods that you talk about in your book, like what are the common themes? Like I, I know that yeah, protein has a thermogenic effect. I know fiber does. What are some of the you know, properties, if you will, of these foods that help with your metabolism? Well, well, let me, let me explain how your body, how food can fire up your body's metabolism. So I'm going to take you back to body fat. Like, you know, again, I'm not a diet person. In fact, I don't really like fad diets and trend diets and crash diets. And, you know, like anyone else, I have stepped out of the shower and out of the corner of my eye, I see something on my body in the mirror that like, yeah, I don't like that. I, I, I got to, get in a better shape or I got to get in a better diet. Like, I mean, it's, it happens to all of us, right? That's a common thing. And then you step on a scale and the number that comes up isn't the number that you had hoped for. So you feel right away from the get go, like, oh man, I got to, I'm disappointed. I got to do something about it. Well, I can tell you that in my book, what I want people to realize is that science is empowering us because you can buy these metabolism activating fight fatting foods right in our grocery store. So in the book, I actually... The whole second section of the book, if you're anybody who wants to like have surprise and delight, I write the book as if you, if I invited you, like when you were a kid to jump into the grocery cart, um, I take you on a tour of the grocery store. I invite you like a, like a kid to jump into like your mom's grocery cart where she's pushing you around. What I do is I whisper in your ear and tell you what to put in the cart. So you go to the produce section and there are foods that are like tomatoes that have lycopene that actually dissolve into your body fat within an hour or so after you eat the tomato. And that lycopene turns on your body fat. And what it does, it, it doesn't turn on the jiggly fat. It turns on the kind of fat called brown fat. And brown fat isn't jiggly. It's not lumpy bumpy. It's paper thin. And it's paper thin and it's pressed along your neck, under your breastplate, under your arms, a little bit behind your back, a little bit in your belly. And when the lycopene from tomatoes and other foods will actually get to your fat, it lights up the fat like the striker you have on a gas oven. You know, you click it, click, 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 whoosh. When that brown fat lights up, it's literally burning. It's thermogenic, meaning it's a space heater. It creates heat. In order to create heat, to fire up, it has to draw energy, right? Just like a space heater does, you gotta plug it in. Or just like your gas range does, it draws down the gas from a gas tank. Now, in this case, your brown fat, when it fires up due to food, Okay, which could be tomatoes, could be chili peppers, by the way, serrano chilies, ancho chilies, Anaheim chilies, will all do this in their own way, fires up the brown fat. And where does that your brown fat draw its fuel from? It draws it from the harmful fat that stored extra energy. So good fat, brown fat will burn down harmful fat, white fat, jiggly fat, and it draws it right down. And the first place it goes is from the most dangerous kind of fat that's stuck inside your body. All right. So Foods like tomatoes, ancho peppers, avocado, broccoli, bok choy, onions, garlics, green onions, red onions. These are all foods that you would see in the grocery store. Tangerines, lemons, watermelon, 
You know, sound familiar? Anyone listening to this? These are actually, science has shown, these are metabolizing, metabolism activating foods. They trigger your brown fat to start turning on its space heater function to burn down extra fuel. And then what I do is I take people from the produce section into the other sections of the grocery store, including the beverage section, including the forbidden middle aisles. Remember people used to say, don't shop, only shop on the perimeter, stay away from the middle aisles. I tell people there are treasures, metabolism acting treasure foods right in those middle aisles. You just need to be able to tell the real gold from the fool's gold. So that's why I call the whole chapter treasure hunt. And then we can go to the seafood section to look for healthy metabolism activating foods as well. The long and short of it is that you can get these foods in your regular grocery store. That means that it's accessible to everyone. And many of these foods are pretty inexpensive as well. Yeah, thanks for sharing all that because I do think that it is important to pay attention to the quality of your diet as you are making these small changes in your nutrition and in your health because over time what you will find is that you're going to feel better overall you're going to feel better physically you will start to lose i think more weight because just by default i think a lot of these foods as well tend to have less calories right than do like a lot of the other like processed foods and i just think you'll find that it's not as hard once you get down the path a little bit you'll realize like since you feel better You'll now have like a deeper connection to it. And you're like, man, I'm so glad I'm doing this. I want to continue to feel like this. I'm not going to stop. And I know we've spent some time talking about metabolism. We've talked about like body fat and brown fat and how to combat all this. I want to talk about sleep because I think that, you know, without us getting a good quality night's sleep, I think it's going to be hard to do any of the stuff that we're talking about now, right? What have you found in research? What have you found in your own practice or even in your own experience with regards to habits? you know, nutrition habits and things we can do on a daily basis to help improve the quality of the sleep? Like, what have you found with that? Well, first of all, one of the remarkable things about sleep is how restorative it actually is. But sleeping is one of those everyday activities that nobody teaches us how to do, right? I mean, we, we nobody teaches us really how to eat. Nobody teaches us how to sleep, right? So there's so many factors that can affect our sleep. We don't just get tired and conk out, you know, on the couch. Oh yeah, we can do that, you know, but the fact of the matter is that sleeping is an, there's an art to actually sleeping. There's kind of a preparation phase for sleeping. And again, we live in a modern society with bright lights, you know, a neon, we got all this buzzy activity going on. Anybody who's been to Vegas knows, you know, like that's a town that is set up to keep you from sleeping because it gives you some stimulation, the surround sound stimulation 24 hours a day. Okay. Let me just tell you a couple of things that can be helpful to actually help get better sleep. I think that, you know, if you don't get good sleep, like your whole life is kind of a little bit against you. So number one, staying physically active, being physically active during the day. You can go to the gym, you can go for a run, but you don't have to. Just going for a walk for 30 minutes actually will help exercise your brain, your circulation, your muscles in a way that actually will help you sleep later in the day. It sends signals to your body that you, it needs to renew itself and sleep is part of renewal. So, you know, something as easy as taking a walk uh, for a half an hour every day after dinner or frankly, anytime or split it up actually is a little trick that actually is very useful. Obviously, you don't want to be taking stimulants just before bedtime. Now, I'm somebody who can drink a cup of coffee. I, I can I used to live in Italy during my gap year, so I'll have a cup of a little tiny cup of espresso after dinner. Doesn't bother me. But for a lot of people, okay, it's an individual. For a lot of people, you know, if you have caffeine at the end of the day after dinner, like it's gonna make you wired for the rest of the night, and then you're not gonna get good sleep. So I think be really, really mindful of what you're putting into your body as you get into the evening time, particularly, you know, what what are you drinking for dinner? All right. Ironically, you know, even though people say you drink wine or beer, you know, alcohol makes me sleepy. It can make you sleepy, but actually when you actually have booze in your system, you never actually get good deep sleep. The alcohol in your brain actually doesn't allow you to go dive deep. So you kind of a little bit near the surface, you're restless, you're not you're not getting full renewal sleep. And so that's why, you know, it's important just to recognize that among other reasons you want to control alcohol intake, you know, cut down or cut out, it will interfere with your sleep. Now, the other thing is actually the volume of food. If you eat a lot of food for dinner at night before you go to bed, and especially if you eat close to bedtime, that insulin is jacked up, 
your body is full on trying to store that energy, the fuel that you've just eaten into your cells. That's a lot of work, man. And, you know, your factory is running full blast storing these things. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, if you've ever moved out of an apartment or a house, this is like, you know, like when you eat, when you overeat or you eat too close to bedtime, imagine having an entire crew packing up your house, trying to store everything. All right. That's pretty disruptive. And so you can't just brush your teeth and lay down and expect you're going to crash right away. So give yourself more time and don't eat too much. Don't overload your metabolism. It's going to dog you as you get into your night. And by the way, if you're not getting good quality sleep, you're also, your metabolism is not burning the energy optimally either. You're cutting into that aspect of trying to elevate your own health. Now, obviously stress, again, going all the way back to what we were talking about at the very beginning, stress, trauma, anger, emotional injury, anxiety, those things also, if we don't confront them somehow and deal with them, there's lots of different tools that can be used to deal with them. If we don't confront that part of it, we're also not going to get a good night's sleep. All right. And by the way, when you don't get a good night's sleep, something that's not known by a lot of people is that when we're sleeping deeply, our brain detoxifies itself. But the way that it detoxifies itself is by opening a sewer system. So most people don't know that our brains have a sewer system called the glymphatic system. Literally, it's like the sewers of underground sewers of Paris. All right. They're actually shut during the day. Nothing really leaks out of your brain. Your brain wants to hang on to everything that all the input you're giving to it, but it accumulates toxins. It accumulates uh, free radicals. It accumulates toxins from the food that we eat, the air that we breathe, the inflammation that actually is part that can happen and function in your brain. At night, when you get good quality sleep, the glymphatic system opens up like the sewers of Paris and it flushes out all those toxins, all that waste products, all the dead cells, all the inflammation gets flushed out of your brain. When you don't get good quality sleep or when you get little sleep, disturbed sleep, the sewer system doesn't fully open. And that's why when you don't get a good night's rest, the next day you feel foggy. You feel a little headachey. You feel a little confused, muddy, toxic brain. 